Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery again. In this uh, episode covering the life and travels of Admiral Zhang He and his fellow eunuch admirals, we're going to do an overview of the seven voyages that happened between 1405 and 1433. We're not going to get to Gavin Menzies in this episode, but next time we'll look at his version of events that happened between the sixth and seventh voyages. He makes some rather provocative claims about what happened during the last two voyages. So let's just get right into it and see how far we can go before the buzzer rings. I know we sort of already knocked off Voyage 1 last time. So to get the whole thing going, 1403, the Yongle Emperor blows the bugle and calls for this whole shipbuilding project to begin. The whole idea of this maritime fleet had initially begun under the Yongle Emperor's father, the founding Hongwu Emperor. It's said that in the Nanjing area alone in 1391, something like 50 million trees were planted so that enough wood could be harvested to build the kind of fleet he had in mind. Nanjing is never going to be the same again. After he becomes emperor, the Yongle emperor plans this whole elaborate and comprehensive tributary system. He figures he'll send these ships out into the world, let everyone see them with their own eyes, you know, and see how much greater and more powerful China is compared to them. And then he'd get them to pay tribute at the same time Trade will explode with all these states, kingdoms, and sultanates, and whatnot, and everything will be great, and China will have carved out their sphere of influence in all the important parts of the world. At this time in the early 15th century, China had been master of the seas for already half a millennium. The great naval tradition that began in earnest during the Southern Song Dynasty, 1132 to 1279, and further, during the Yuan, was now carried to its zenith under the Ming Emperor Yongle. China, as a great and mighty maritime power, didn't suddenly start in the early Ming Dynasty. This went all the way back to the time of the Song, after the capital was moved to Hangzhou, which back in the southern Song was called Lin'an. 1405, Ma He, now renamed Zheng He the year previous, was 34 years old when the first of the seven voyages began. Voyages one, two, and three were going to wow the folks wherever they went. It was the same trip three times to the same places that I mentioned last time. Champa, Surabaya, Palambang, Malacca, Samudera, Gale, and then finishing up in Calicut on the Malabar coast. Voyage one, we rushed through last time. They picked up a whole lot of ambassadors and brought them back to Nanjing, and this made the Yongle Emperor very happy, with the exception of failing to find the Jianwen Emperor. Voyage one was a clear case of mission accomplished, and Zheng He did a splendid job. And being a Muslim and all, you couldn't have asked for a more perfect representative to win friends among many of the lands they visited. They returned to Nanjing in 1407. The ambassadors did their thing. The Yongle Emperor got to feel the pure joy and pleasure, at least for him, of having all these envoys from all around the region prostrate themselves before him and do the whole full-blown act of kotowing. Gifts were exchanged, and they hung out for a while. Despite everything, the movements of these visitors were still strictly controlled, and none of them had the freedom to go, you know, take in the sights of early Ming China. Now, this wasn't cheap, taking care of all these envoys and their retinue. No sooner had all the ceremonies taken place, all the fun and entertainment, when it was time to take all these guys back to where they came from. And that's what Voyage 2 was sort of all about. It was a much smaller scale operation this time, only 68 vessels, although I read other accounts that said this fleet consisted of 249 ships, and Zheng He got off early after stopping in Fujian. He stopped off to deal with matters regarding the repairs to an important temple to uh, Mazu. The rest of the fleet sailed on without him. So voyage two, 1407 to 1409, Zheng He was in charge, but he didn't make the trip. So they sailed to Calicut with many stops along the way, the ambassador to the King of Siam, present-day Thailand, he was dropped off. The Thais were locked in a struggle with their neighbor to the east, the Khmers. These are the people of present-day Cambodia. The Thais made an alliance with Ming China, and now they had a Daka Da in their 
back pocket that they were able to use as a lever against the marauding Khmers. Ma Huan had some rather interesting things to say uh, about the Thais. Now, Ma Huan, who we'll meet in the next voyage, he made some observations about the role of women in Thai society relative to women in China. He wrote, quote, It is their custom that all affairs are managed by their wives, both the king of the country and the common people. If they have matters which require thought and deliberation, punishments light and heavy, all trading transactions, great and small, they all follow the decisions of their wives, for the mental capacity of the wives certainly exceeds that of the men. Ma Huan, just by coincidence, happened to be surnamed Ma, which is also a common surname for non-Muslim Chinese as well. He converted to Islam later as a young man. What made him special, at least to Zheng He, was that Ma Huan could speak Arabic and perhaps Persian as well. And those were, as you can imagine, the lingua franca of the Muslim and trading world that rimmed the coasts of the Indian Ocean and Arabian Sea. Ma Huan only took part in the fourth, sixth, and seventh voyages. His observations, all meticulously written down, survive to this day, or at least most of it does. It's called the Yin Yai Sheng Lan, or the Overall Survey of the Ocean's Shores. This was published after the end of the seventh and final maritime expedition in 1433. Now, all the minutia that we know about these voyages came from Ma Huan. He only went on three of the seven, but the ones he went on, particularly the last two, were quite useful for his copious amounts of interesting observations wherever he went. I downloaded a PDF of his book uh, off some website, in translation, of course, and I'm going to check it out uh, later, one of these days, maybe. So Ma Huan, originally from the area around Shaoxing, one of the many famosas to come from that historic city, home of Shaoxing wine, Lu Xun, Zhou Enlai, Xi Shi, Lu Yo, Wang Xi Zhi, Qiu Jin, Cai Yuanpei, all household names in China, taught in every middle school history class. So a lot of what we know came from Ma Huan, and his accounts were corroborated by others who lived in these port cities of South and Southwest Asia, you know, and they also left behind writings about this time. The 20 chapters of Ma's book are priceless in their descriptions of all the places visited, Champa, Palembang, Thailand, Malacca, Sri Lanka, Quilon, Cochin, Dofar, Aden, Hormuz, Maka, and in Maka is where he saw what he called the Heavenly Square and all the other cities all the way to Malindi and Kenya. He visited them all and gave the whole skinny on each place, the customs, food, dress, politics, military, religion, you know, whatever he saw. One notable thing that happened, the ruler of Brunei, Abdul Majid Hassan, he owed his leadership and authority to China. This happened after Zheng He intervened in this rivalry, his rivalry with the Majapahit kingdom of Java. And this allowed Brunei to break off and form their own sultanate. And he had come back with Zheng He on the first voyage to go pay tribute to the emperor and show his gratitude. But when it came time to sail back on the second voyage, this new ruler got sick and died in Nanjing, only 38 years old. He was buried in Nanjing with all the dignity and ceremony due a ruler who had paid tribute to the emperor of China. The Yongle emperor put all his best doctors on this case, and they did their best to treat the stricken king from Bodhi, or Boni, as uh, they called Brunei back then. Now in Mandarin, it, uh, Brunei is called Wenlai. But, alas, despite the emperor's best efforts, Abdul Majid Hassan passed away and it was not lost on the sultan's retinue with how much concern and care the emperor of China treated their king. And it was one of their dying sultan's wishes that they go back to Brunei and tell the people how well he was treated. So China and Brunei, they go way back. May 12, 1958, right before the Great Leap Forward. As it always goes, some villager or farmer was digging somewhere and found a part of this sultan's tomb. And it was, you know, reported and then later excavated and studied. So when you are next in Nanjing, you can go visit this tomb. And remember, Sultan Majid Hassan, he came with Zheng He on the first voyage, but 
When it came time for the second voyage, he didn't make it. The second voyage was all about taking all these envoys back and further consolidating and fortifying these trade relations with all the great centers of the trade and spices and all kinds of exotica and treasures. In 1409, the second voyage ended, and in the fall of that same year, the third maritime expedition made its way to the Arabian Sea, to the Malabar coast. This time, Zheng He was in command and present for the whole journey. His two right hands, eunuchs Wang Jinghong and Hou Xuan, are with him, along with 30,000 men. These two are unsung heroes of the voyages of Zheng He. Zheng He gets all the glory, but these guys and others were there every step of the way and shared the adventures right there with Zheng He. They traced the route of the previous two journeys, and on this particular voyage, they stopped at a place... Uh, in the old Javanese language, uh, was called uh, Temasek. In Sanskrit, it was called Singapura, Lion City. Today, this area is called Singapore. Back in Zheng He's day, Singapura didn't have much to show for itself. It was heavily dependent on the uh, Sultan of Malacca. A special deal was struck with the Malaccan ruler that allowed him to break away from the power and influence of the King of Siam. And this, you know, infuriates the Siamese, but endears the Malaccan ruling house to the Chinese. And Malacca enjoyed such a special status. It became one of the key, if not the key, trading hub for the whole region. So once their brave and daring king, Paramaswara, had China behind him, no one dared mess with Malacca. Malacca wasn't a part of Malaysia blessed with natural resources. The city lived or died as a trading entrepot. Malacca served as sort of the halfway point between the Spice Islands of Indonesia and the Malabar coast of India. It was the gateway to the Indian Ocean. The established trading centers on Sumatra, Palembang, and Samudera had always had the riches of the spice trade all to themselves. So then midway geographically between these two great centers comes Malacca on the other side of the strait, and they turn out to be very aggressive to push as much trade as possible over to their side, and you know, they created some real heated competition. Well, after getting all replenished and refreshed in Malacca, the fleet took off for Samudera at the northern part of Sumatra. Then again, it was a straight shot across the Indian Ocean to Gale in Ceylon, and even back then, the Sinhalese were fighting the Tamils in the north. Like last time, Zheng He did not get a good reception or anywhere near the kind of welcome he was expecting. So he was sent packing right fast, and he vowed to come back another day and deal with this leader who dissed his emperor. The Chinese version of events went something like this. Despite the home field advantage and numerical superiority, the Sinhalese couldn't defeat the soldiers of the Ming, and their ruler was captured and taken back to Nanjing and then later pardoned. The Sinhalese version of what happened doesn't go anything like this. On this voyage, Zheng He, even though a devout Muslim, left behind uh, in Ceylon one of these carved stone tablets or steles that was inscribed with all kinds of respectful words concerning the Buddha and Buddhism. June 16, 1411, Zheng He returns to China and voyage number three is now behind him. And like the other two times, all these leaders and ambassadors from Leaders all piled into Nanjing and were put up at the best digs in town and just doted on. And when it came time to do the whole kotow thing, they all did it. And they presented their gifts to the emperor. Of course, they were lavished with the most expensive and beautiful things that China could produce. One thing that the Yongle emperor appreciated above all else, and believe me, with all the fine treasures he was handed before, it took a lot to impress this guy. But when the Malaccan king presented the Yongle Emperor with a magnifying glass. That was a showstopper. So after six non-stop years of travel in the employ of the Emperor, Zheng He and his fellow admirals get a well-deserved two-year break before they had to head out on voyage number four. But before he goes, Zheng He, he knows he's made the Emperor happy, even though he hasn't located the Jianwen Emperor, but there was still hope. But Zheng He felt he had done enough and he boldly asks the Emperor Yongle to allow for some sort of monument to be built that would honor the goddess Matsu. And Matsu being the protector of sailors and goddess of the sea, Zheng He 
held her in the highest esteem and was thankful to the goddess for getting them out of a few tight spots on the high seas during the past three voyages. The emperor grants Zheng He his wish, and this monument is built and becomes known as the Dapao Unsi, the Temple of Repaid Gratitude. It's also called the Nanjing Taota. This 240-foot-tall monument, sometimes included among the seven wonders of the world, we know as the Porcelain Pagoda. It truly was a wonder to behold, especially at night when it was all lit up with lanterns shining off the smooth and lustrous ceramic surface of the tower. In 1856, the tower, before it was blown up by the Taiping rebels, uh, was immortalized in Longfellow's epic poem, Ketamos, from which the word ceramic is derived. I'll read from Longfellow as he described the tower Zheng He built to repay the goddess Matsu for her protection all those years. And yonder by Nankin behold the tower of porcelain strange and old, uplifting to the astonished skies its ninefold painted balconies with balustrades of twining leaves and roofs of tile beneath whose eaves hang porcelain bells that all the time ring with a soft, melodious chime, while the whole fabric is ablaze with very tints all fused in one, great mass of color like a maze of flowers illumined by the sun. So, January 1414, Zheng He sets out for what would be the most ambitious voyage to date, this time they were going further than before. Voyage 4 will take Zheng He all the way to Hormuz, the southern tip of Persia, and along with Calicut, one of the great world centers of trade. The first three voyages were successful enough so that by the time of the fourth voyage, Ming Dynasty China is at its peak of greatness. The Yongle Emperor wasn't going to stop there. He had his sights set on Hormuz and was determined to let the Persian and Arab traders there get a chance to bask in China's greatness also. As I mentioned before, Ma Huan is now traveling along with Zheng He. He's only 25 years old, but as I said, a fluent Arabic speaker and of Persian as well. His chronicles of the voyage are priceless, and much of it survives to this day. And he kept his eyes open, and like I said, he was there for voyages 4, 6, and 7. He didn't participate in number 5. The fleet made its way westward like it always did. Zheng He got involved in a local rivalry in the Sumatran kingdom of Samudera. He put all of China's chips on one of the two leaders contending for power there, the more Yongle friendly of the two, who ultimately prevailed over the other. One of the noteworthy things that happened during Journey 4 is that after they reached Bande Aceh, they split up and part of the fleet led by the eunuch Yang Min, headed due north, past the Nicobar Islands, past the Andaman Islands, and up to where present-day Chittagong is. Yang Min takes the King of Bengal back to Nanjing with him, bearing one of the most amazing and jaw-dropping gifts. Believe it or not, packed with all the cargo was none other than a giraffe. I don't know if any of you can recall the first time you saw a giraffe in person. That such a thing existed was a marvel to the Chinese. They called the animal a chilin, which is one of the four sacred animals of China, along with the dragon, phoenix, and tortoise. The chilin is a kind of chimera. It had a head like a dragon with a pair of horns, and the legs were like an oxen with hoofs. Later on, they were shown with dragon scales all over. They looked fearsome enough, but they were vegetarians. The thing about chilins is that they only appeared when there was a wise and just ruler on the throne. When a Chilin appeared, it was a fantastically good omen, and so it was that a circle of officials at the imperial court who had access to the emperor called this giraffe a Chilin and did one heck of a pi ma pi job on the emperor, cooing to him what a great omen this was and how it meant the Yongle emperor really had heaven's favor and was great in all ways. You know, the Yongle emperor just ate it all up. He had several giraffes, in fact. That was uh, the first of several to come. The giraffes came from Somalia. They were probably laden on board in Mogadishu. Must have been 
quite a logistical effort to get this giraffe from the grasslands of Somalia to the delta where the Ganges and Brahmaputra rivers join together, and then from there to Nanjing. By the way, in Japanese, the word chilin is pronounced kirin, just like the bear. So next time you're having a kirin bear at your local soba or sushi joint, check out the chilin that's on the label. Now, between now and the last voyage, more of these chilins are going to make their way to China, and the Yongle Emperor is going to put them all in his private zoo, China's first. And I think this is where the late Michael Jackson might have gotten that idea from. So voyage number four goes all the way to Hormuz, and I have to think those Persian traders must have been elated to have these direct trade links established with the Chinese. Up to this point... The traders of Hormuz and all points west of there were dependent on all the middlemen along the Malabar coast for their porcelains, silks, and other precious cargoes from China. And with 18 envoys on board by the end of the voyage, Zheng He sailed back to China, another mission accomplished. The fourth voyage went well, and by the summer of 1415, they were back in Nanjing, and on November 16th, 1416, they all had the big ceremony where everyone prostrated themselves before the emperor and did the whole kowtowing ceremony. Around this time, the emperor is doing something that is going to later have major repercussions, not only on his legacy, but the whole Ming dynasty as well. Back in 1403, before the first voyage ever sailed, the Yongle Emperor changed the name of the northern city of Beijing to Beijing. Beijing means northern capital, and Nanjing means southern capital. And remember, before it was Beijing, it was Datu, Kublai Khan's capital during the Yuan Dynasty. Now, he was making all this noise about moving the main capital back up there. With so much going so smooth down in the south, the emperor believed He had to get back up north to deal with the age-old problems up there with, you know, invasion from the steppes. He dodged a bullet when Tamerlane died on the way to annihilating the Chinese in 1405. But there was still more to be done, and he felt it was better for China if he was up in the north to keep a closer eye on things. So with this decision to move the capital up north, this sets in motion an enterprise no less costly and complicated than sending these fleets out into the world. To pull up stakes in Nanjing and move the entire government operation, the court, all the princes, princesses, you know, you name it, everything, to move this all up to Beijing required a lot of time to plan and execute. On top of this, there were two other costly measures. One was the construction of the Forbidden City, a little pet project of the Yongle Emperor to wow the foreign visitors even more than the treasure ships. Work began on the Forbidden City around the time of the first voyage. The other major project was the dredging, repair, and extension of the Grand Canal from 1411 to 1415. By the time of Emperor Yongle, The Grand Canal is already a thousand years old, and you can imagine it needed a little facelift. By 1416, the Da Yunhe is ready again for anything, and it's in the best shape ever. So, voyage numero cinco sails away in 1417. This time they go even further than Hormuz and make it all the way to the Yemeni's seaport city of Aden. Now, Hormuz is to the Persian Gulf what Aden is to the Red Sea. Now, Ma Huan isn't aboard for this journey, but he's there for the 6th and 7th, and he makes a boatload of observations of that whole area that I won't get into here, but I'll see what I can do uh, to hook you up with some links to his book, the Ying Yai Shen Lan. And I couldn't find the uh, Chinese characters for that book. Anyway, young Ma Huan, an early 15th century literate and intelligent man, accompanied not only Zheng He, but all of his greatest admirals. It wasn't just Zheng He. He couldn't be everywhere to get maximum penetration throughout the region. The fleet would split up, and his great admirals, who were all eunuchs, would lead their ships to the lesser ports that weren't as important as Malacca, Calicut, and Hormuz. Now, a good example of that was when Admiral Yangmin went to Chittagong to go deal with the ruler there and bring him back to Nanjing with the giraffe. 
the Qilin. Besides Zheng He, there was also Zhou Man, Zhou Wen, Yang Qing, Hong Bao. These four we're going to revisit when we discuss Gavin Menzies and his two books, 1421 and 1434. We, when did I become royal? Anyway, back to Aden, uh, this port was sort of the center, the Zhongxing, of trade between the whole Mediterranean and the Far East. So early 15th century, you can imagine this place is thriving. Admiral Zhou Man is tasked with establishing tributary relations with the king there. And as luck would have it, the king there was in a major power struggle with the Mamelukes in Egypt for control of Mecca and Medina. Once he establishes relations with China, though, he wins out, and from that point on, the king of Aden was China's man. So he gets the full treatment and hops on board for the return journey and an imperial junket to Nanjing. He brought on board for the emperor some new creatures for his zoo, some ostriches, lions, and zebras. And again, China gets one more link up the supply chain, establishing themselves right there in the port of Aden, where it was easy to run into people from all over Europe. By the time of this fifth voyage, it's only about 70 years, more or less, after the Black Death in Europe, Lorenzo de' Medici, still three decades away from being born when the fifth voyage set sail, when this fleet was sailing towards Aden, the Council of Constance was only just then resolving the problem of the schism in the church and the problem of the three popes. As China enjoys this unparalleled status as the most advanced, richest, and culturally magnificent place on earth, all the groundwork is being quietly laid for what was to explode in Europe, beginning right around the time China retired from the world stage and began looking inward. The Renaissance in Europe at this time, it still hadn't quite happened yet. From Aden, they went on to the East African coast, the Swahili coast, these were the lands that today make up the countries of Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, and Tanzania. Some envoys received during the fourth voyage were returned to their respective places, and new trade and tribute relations were made with these East African rulers. This is where it all began. Tanzania and China, especially since the founding days of the PRC, have always been the bestest of friends. So it's during these days when Zheng He's treasure fleet sailed the high seas that China and Tanzania first began getting to know one another. There was uh, one thing, you know, Africa being Africa. The continent simply contained the most exotic of all exotica. They had the coolest animals, plants, new kinds of foods and spices that could only be obtained there. So on this fifth voyage, when the Chinese got to see up close how rich this place was, they really took this to heart when they were planning the 6th and 7th voyages. July 15th, 1419, the 5th voyage comes to an end. The Yongle Emperor is just bowled over with all the curiosities brought back from Africa. You just can't believe it. And of course, these people appearing in all their native costumes were quite the magnificent sight to behold, especially, you know, seeing it for the first time. It was quite a sensation. If there was anyone on Earth in 1419, who could rightly stand on the bow of the Titanic and scream out he was the king of the world, it was the Yongle Emperor. Two years later, his world will come crashing down on him, and he will live with sadness and regret for the few years he had left. As he starts closing in on his final years, it becomes quite cruel and fickle indeed, and the number of dead and mutilated bodies he leaves in his wake are going to diminish somewhat all the great things he did for China and Chinese culture. But let's not jump ahead too far. We still have the sixth voyage of Zheng He. By the spring of 1421, the emperor said, it's time to take these guys back to their states and kingdoms. Now, this is the last voyage that the Yongle emperor has anything to do with. This fleet is going to return in 1422, and then the Yongle emperor dies two years later in 1424. So the seventh and final voyage will be called for by the Xuanda Emperor. This is also the voyage that is discussed in Gavin Menzies' book, 1421, the year China discovered the world. I'll hold off for now. Let's just get through these two final voyages and all the sad and tragic events that went down in Beijing as Zheng He and his fellow admirals were all 
doing their thing, returning ambassadors to their respective lands, taking on two or three dozen new ones, trading, and carrying out all kinds of commercial activities and all these melting pots all over southeast, southwest, and the Middle East of Asia, and now up and down the Swahili coast in Africa. I'm going to just go straight to the seventh and final voyage of Zheng He and all the events that went down in Beijing uh, in between the sixth and seventh voyages. The major event was the opening of the Forbidden City and the amazing palace complex. This was in uh, February 1421, just prior to the departure of the fleet for the sixth voyage. In fact, Zheng He had to hustle back from the fifth voyage because he had to be on hand for the opening day ceremony. No sooner does the brand spanking new Imperial Palace open, at an exorbitant cost, I might add, suddenly, on May 9th, 1421, just a few months later, it's struck by lightning that causes a fire that turns into a conflagration that burns down the entire Forbidden City, all 8 million square feet. Now, Zheng He is thousands and thousands of miles away when this happens, and he doesn't hear about it till later. This was a crushing blow to the Yongle Emperor. And you can imagine at a time like this in history when omens meant divine intervention, this looked particularly bad. The whole spot of bad luck screamed out to the Emperor that this whole zany idea to move the capital, to build such a monumental over-the-top palace with almost a thousand buildings, was simply not meeting with heaven's favor. It would not be rebuilt until the 1450s. Then, right on top of this, the Yongle Emperor's favorite concubine, Madame Wang, the Zhao Xian Guifei, she too dies, and this is just too much for the Emperor. Then he suffers a bad riding accident, falling off the horse that had once belonged to Tamerlane. So he enters a slump that he's never able to bounce back from, and when he died, he dragged a whole heck of a lot of concubines and others with him. But heaven isn't through with Yongle just yet. In the wake of all this bad luck, there were terrible famines in Shandong and epidemics in Fujian. The northern part of Vietnam, Annam, had been defeated by the Ming armies and thus began for the fourth time in history, a period when Vietnam was under China's thumb. But by this time, in 1421-1422, the area was up in arms and soon they'll be kicking China out for good. But before he passed from this earth, the Yongle Emperor tried to make amends. One thing he did was he finally listened to the conservatives at court, the Confucianist officials, who for over a decade have been trying in vain to get the emperor to abandon these very expensive maritime expeditions. The emperor thereupon looks westward and decides this is where the current problems lie, and he leads an expedition against the Mongol Tartars, who were not only refusing to pay tribute, but were also harassing Chinese interests out in the west and northwest. April 12, 1422, the emperor sets out from Beijing to do battle, and again in the summer of 1424 to finish the job. August 12, 1424, the Yongle emperor dies somewhere in Inner Mongolia. The emperor gets to be the first of 13 Ming emperors to be buried at the Ming tombs just north of Beijing. Zheng He, meanwhile, was in Palembang in Sumatra dealing with a local political struggle there when all this happened. So he didn't know that his benefactor had now passed from this earth. When he heads back to China after his mission, a new emperor is sitting on the throne. This mission to Palembang, by the way, did not constitute a voyage. This was just a simple mission that Zheng He personally handled without the kind of entourage that came with the previous six voyages. So on September 7th, 1424, the Hongxi Emperor mounts the throne, and he's the guy, at least for a while. First thing he does is cancel the maritime voyages permanently. Zheng He is relieved of all powers and authority and is pushed to head up the military command headquarters in Nanjing, Then the second thing he does, the Hongxi Emperor, is call for the capital to be moved back to Nanjing. Then he starts to bring in all kinds of disgraced and marginalized Confucians back into the government bureaucracy. Under Yongle, the eunuchs, of which Zheng He was a major mover and shaker in this faction, they were on top. Now, with the Hongxi Emperor in charge, the eunuch faction lost a great deal of its prestige. But... Fortune smiled on them. The Hongxi Emperor dies much too soon. 
nine months into his reign, May 29, 1425, and put in his place as the emperor's son, who we know as the Xuanda Emperor. And it's this guy who is going to call for one last and final voyage for Zheng He. So with uh, Xuanda, all of 26 years old, in charge, the plans to move the capital back to Nanjing are scrapped, and it's in Beijing that the capital stays. The eunuchs and the Confucianists are once again, like many times before in Chinese history, locked in another classic power struggle. And as far as Zheng He is concerned, he's squarely within the eunuchs faction. Well, 1430 rolls around. It's five years into his reign, and the Xuanda emperor feels China isn't getting the respect it once did. The tribute system had sort of slowed to a crawl. So on June 29, 1430, the emperor calls for another voyage with the intention to kickstart the whole tribute system again. This seventh and final voyage, Zheng He's swan song, was going to be grand in scale. 300 ships, 27,500 men. Zheng He knew this was going to be his last voyage to sea, and he might not make it back. He was only 62 years old, but in the 1400s, that was already considered quite old. Zheng He had two steles engraved. One, he set up at Liu Jia Harbor, where all of his journeys had begun, and the other was placed in the major trading port of Changle in Fujian province. Zheng He also left an account of his travels that he wrote in 1431, but like almost everything that bears official witness to these travels, it didn't survive except in bits and pieces. The inscriptions on the two steles he left behind before he departed on the final voyage serve as primary sources that describe where and why these treasure fleets travel to these faraway places. There are also primary sources that give detailed lists of gifts that were exchanged and from whom. You can learn a lot from this. There were three accounts, well, at least three, that give firsthand observations made during these various voyages. I already mentioned the account made by Ma Huan in his Ying Yai Shenglan. Uh, Fei Xin and Gong Zhen also left accounts as well. Fei Xin, we didn't talk about much. He accompanied Zheng He on voyages 3, 5, and 7. His book, written in 1436, was called the Xing Cha Shenglan. The fleet departed on the seventh voyage on January 19, 1431. Joan of Arc is on trial in Normandy when the fleet departs, and she'll be burned at the stake a month later. The fleet makes a long stop in Fujian and linger for about a year before they trace the now very familiar steps. And on December 10th, 1432, they arrive in Calicut. At Calicut, the fleet splits up. Admiral Hongbao went to Hormuz and to the east coast of Africa. But sometime in 1433, Zheng He was ailing from some unknown chronic illness. He couldn't go on with the rest of the fleet and stayed in Calicut, where he died. The voyage back to China would take three months, so taking his body back was out of the question. Therefore, Zheng He was buried at sea near Calicut with full honors. Some say this ceremony took place near Semarang between Jakarta and Surabaya on the island of Java. An elaborate tomb was built on the southern outskirts of Nanjing near Bull's Head Hill or Niushou. Inside this tomb is a lock uh, from Zheng He's braid and a pair of his shoes. July 1433, the treasure fleet returns to China, and needless to say, the Xuan the Emperor's hopes and aspirations to revive the golden age of the tribute system and to have China project the power that it once did under the Yongle Emperor, this didn't materialize. He himself died in early 1435, and with the passing of the Xuanda Emperor, that spelled the end of these voyages, as no Ming Dynasty Emperor would champion these kinds of diplomatic missions. This is a tough decision. Back in the Ming Dynasty, they had to ask themselves if they should fund these outlandishly expensive projects. What was the benefit? Even today in the U.S., you know, we have to ask, should we fund NASA to explore these places where no man has gone before? Should we shut NASA down? Yeah, look at what happened the other day with the Mars mission and hope the U.S. Congress can scrounge around and find more funding for them and for science in general. Well, each of the seven voyages of Zheng He, I read, cost as much as half the annual taxation revenue for the whole country. They were 
horrifically expensive, and it's hard to say whether the Ming Dynasty or China benefited or not from the voyages. Whatever the case, the port culls came crashing down, and with the Yongle Emperor gone, Zheng He gone, there wasn't anyone around to champion such ventures. The wind was blowing hard into the sails of the Confucian elites who found no merit in these treasure fleets and looked at the whole thing as a preposterous waste of state money. In fact, so horrible and ruinous to the state did they see these seven voyages of Zheng He that all official records that would have given us a clear and accurate picture of everything that happened with you know, wherever Zheng He went were famously destroyed. Nothing exists other than the steles and monuments Zheng He left behind and whatever Ma Huan, Fei Xin, and others left us with. It's slim pickings indeed, and when we get to Gavin Menzies next time, you'll see he's always left saying, you know, if only the official records hadn't been destroyed, you know, well, whatever, they were destroyed or just went underground and haven't resurfaced yet, time will tell. Not having any of these official primary source documents really hampers our efforts to know more about the exact details concerning China's role in the region. And in the case of Gavin Menzies' two books, we can't know for sure about any other worlds that may have been visited by the fleet between 1421 and 1434. And the way things panned out in China, the whole age of unfettered regional trade between all points between Nanjing and East Africa just petered out, and from about the 1550s onward... China began their long period of isolation right at the exact moment that things were just starting to take off in Europe. As China was winding things down, Prince Henry the Navigator was just getting started. 1488, Bartholomew Diaz rounded the Cape of Good Hope. 1492 came Columbus. Then in 1493, Pope Alexander VI splits the world up into two parts, and before China could say anything, half the world belonged to Spain and the other half to Portugal, on paper at least. 1498, Vasco da Gama went further than Diaz. 1513 comes Balboa and the discovery of the Pacific, as well as Ponce de Leon in Florida and Puerto Rico. 1519, Magellan begins his attempt to circumnavigate the world. 1527, Cortes goes dancing across the water with his galleons and guns. And while all of this is unfolding, China is no longer in the game. Their sights are facing inward and also to the West. The age-old problems of yore were still giving the same headaches that had troubled the Han Chinese since the time of the Zhou Kings. And later on, we'll see that in order to keep these guys out of China proper, the Great Wall will be put back into working order until it just becomes another Maginot line. The ruins we see today of the Great Wall are mostly all from the time of the Ming Dynasty renovations. These came much later after Zheng He. We all know what happens. Zheng He goes and primes the pump and gets everything nice and ripe for the Portuguese and later the Dutch to just go in and plunder these places along the Western Ocean and the Spice Islands. And although there were some minor battles where Zheng He went in and took sides against one king or sultan over another... The record clearly shows, and today China boasts about this, they always came in peace. They didn't go in like the Portuguese who left a legacy of war and colonialism in its wake, later replaced famously by the British in the late 18th and 19th centuries. Based on the historical record, no one could point any fingers at China for being an aggressor. Talk about with great power comes great responsibility. China at one time, during this period of the early Ming Dynasty, when everything was so perfect and China enjoyed economic, cultural, and military might that was at the time unsurpassed in all the world. And they used this might peacefully to promote China's name and splendor. And no matter whether the Yongle Emperor did this for China's glory or for his own, either way it made a memorable impression and caused a very noticeable ripple that led to the advancement of mankind. So we're going to end it here. Next time we'll continue on and look at Gavin Menzies' books because he totally departs from what I just told you. He makes some rather provocative claims about how these last two voyages, the 6th and 7th, actually went. So next time we'll look at what he said and also look at what other historians said about those two books, 1421 and 1434. 
I'm going to read through Ma Huan's book and see if there are any interesting or quotable passages to tell you. Anyways, that's next time, and then I think we should be able to finish off the life and times of Admiral Zheng He and move on to something else. A warm welcome to all my new listeners, shooed in this direction by the fine and pleasant folks at the Seneca Podcast, Kaiser, Jeremy, et al., and to all my new followers on Twitter as well, wherever you found me, via Ray Harris at the History of World War II Podcast and from all the various blogs, forums, and whatnot, who have been so kind to put my links on their site and, you know, have recommended me. In a few weeks, to help celebrate the U.S. Labor Day holiday, Ray Harris himself will be here in Claremont, and we're going to have a special chit-chat-a-thon. Ray was coming out to help me celebrate the 100th episode of the China History Podcast, but with Labor Day only 25 days away, and this being the 93rd episode, it's doubtful that the 100th episode will be ready. And neither are numbers 94 through 99, but we'll have a good time nonetheless, and in the very studios where this humble effort of mine is researched, written, and recorded, and produced, I'll have the Ray Harris of the History of World War II podcast, so that's coming up. I can't wait. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the very edge of L.A. County here in the City of Trees and PhDs, Claremont, California. I hope you'll consider joining us next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.